pleased to be able to be uh, the chairman of the commission, and uh, I am uh, very happy to have Governor Charlie Baker, Dr. Bertha Madras, Governor Roy Cooper, former Congressman Patrick Kennedy, as appointed members of the commission by the president. Um, we have been working diligently together, along with other members of the administration, uh, over the course of the last number of months in preparation for this first meeting. Uh, and then uh, we look forward to the work going forward and getting an interim report soon. I want to thank Jared Kushner, who's here um, at the Office of American Innovation. Uh, Jared has been extraordinarily helpful and supportive, as has his whole team, Reed Cordish and the rest, um, in providing us the resources uh, that we need to be able to do this job and to continue to help give us the direction uh, that we uh, are going to need to have as we move forward and help to deal with the challenge that the President has given us. I want to thank Kellyanne Conway as well, counselor to the President, who has been incredibly helpful to us as well, an enormous resource um, inside of this complex. So we have a few things to go through. I, I want to thank Secretary Price, Secretary of Health and Human Services, Secretary Shulkin of Veterans Affairs. I'm going to call on them to make some comments uh, before we start in, in uh, hearing some testimony today um, from members of the nonprofit community. Uh, first, we have to um, uh, check all the legal boxes. So uh, Michael Passante from the Office of National Drug Control Policy will make some initial remarks on the Commission's orientation, and then we can move into the substance of the meeting. So, uh, Michael, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Governor. Good afternoon. I would like to welcome everyone to the first meeting of the President's uh, Commission on Combating Drug Addiction and the Opioid Crisis. Um, the, uh, the Commission was established to provide advice to the President and the Federal Government for improving the effectiveness of the Federal response to drug addiction and the opioid crisis in particular. Uh, the Commission members will prepare for the President interim recommendations within the next few weeks and a final report by October 1st of this year unless the Commission is extended. Um, we greatly appreciate the time and effort that Governor Christie and the Commission members will be volunteering as they work towards solving our nation's drug problems and the opioid crisis. As the DFO for this meeting, I serve as the liaison between the Commission and the Office of National Drug Control Policy. I'm also responsible for ensuring that the Commission complies with federal laws such as the Federal Advisory Committee Act and ethics rules. So at today's meeting, the Commission will hear statements from nine nonprofit organizations as they work every day to find solutions to the opioid crisis and other drug issues. Please note, note that the agenda times are approximate, but we'll strive to ensure adequate time for the Commission's questions and deliberation. Um, in accordance with FACA, minutes of the meeting will be prepared and will be available on the Commission's website, along with the dates and times of future meetings. Uh, meeting agendas, reports, and supporting documents. The Commission's website is at www.whitehouse.gov slash ONDCP, and you can find a page for the President's Commission uh, off of there that has all those updates. The public is also invited to submit written comments for the Commission's consideration by emailing them to commission at ondcp.eop.gov. Again, I want to thank the Commission, Secretary Price, Secretary Shulkin, Department and White House officials, and nonprofit organizations for your participation in today's meeting. And with that, I'll hand it over to New Jersey Governor Chris Christie, the Chairman. Thank you, Michael. I also want to acknowledge Rich Baum uh, from ONDCP. ONDCP has been working hard to provide staff support to us as well, and we appreciate the hard work of the folks at ONDCP. Before I get to the Commissioners, I wanted to get to the members of the Cabinet. Um, to make whatever remarks they would like to make off the top. I want to thank those people who are watching us um, live stream from the public's perspective on the White House website uh, and to be able to allow many more people than could fit in this room to be able to watch the work of this commission. So I thank you all for joining us. And I turn it first to Secretary Price. Um, I thank you, Secretary, for the meeting we had a few weeks ago and the incredible work that your staff has been doing with the staff of the commission to get us um, all pointed in the same direction. So I turn it over for remarks to Secretary uh, Price. Thanks, Governor, and uh, thanks to all of the Commission members as well for their participation and uh, everybody for bringing your expertise. Uh, this is clearly one of the President's uh, uh, top priorities to make certain that we address this scourge uh, of, uh, of the opioid crisis and addiction that has, uh, has run across this land in, in, in uh, ways far and wide that so many could never ever dreamed about uh, at the scale that we're, that we're talking about right now. 
Um, I'm privileged to, to serve as Secretary of Health and Human Services. One of our top three clinical priorities is the opioid crisis, is addiction. Uh, in, that, uh, in that context, we have laid out a, a five-part strategy that we're addressing. We've shared that with the Commission and look forward to having that work hand in glove with the kinds of things that you're doing, uh, starting with the, the recovery and treatment uh, phase, uh, the making certain that all um, uh, available uh, overdose reversing drugs are out there in communities uh, all across this land. Looking at the public health issue, the surveillance issue, how, how, why are we where we are right now? What's happened to make this uh, uh, such, such a scourge? Uh, making certain that we're doing all the things from a research standpoint, whether it's NIH or elsewhere, uh, the exciting kinds of things that can reverse the challenges uh, that, that, that we've got. And then finally, the whole issue of pain management in this nation. As a, Formerly practicing orthopedic surgeon, I know there, there are some perverse incentives in the system that make it such that those individuals who are charged and challenged with caring for our fellow citizens uh, oftentimes feel that they're being pushed in certain directions when, uh, when they otherwise might not, uh, would not want to go in that direction. So we appreciate everybody's participation and involvement. It's an honor to be, uh, to, to be here with you today and look forward to the work product that will come out of this commission, and we're happy to provide whatever services we can to assist. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. I appreciate it very much. Um, Secretary Shulkin, the Secretary of Veterans Affairs, uh, they are doing some really cutting edge things at the VA regarding pain management and those issues for our nation's veterans. Uh, and so I want to turn it over to Secretary Shulkin and thank him for his involvement, the involvement of his staff and what we're doing here, Secretary. All right. Thank, thank you, Governor. Um, this goes without saying, but what you're doing is really important and we thank you for it. This, um, the opioid crisis is just ruining lots of people's lives and lots of families across America. And in the VA, my top clinical priority is to reduce veteran suicides. And when we look at the overlap with substance abuse and opioid abuse, it's really clear. So thank you for focusing on this. At the, at the VA, when it comes to not only the health of veterans, but the health of all Americans, we've learned two things. One is, is that VA is the country's largest integrated health system tends to see problems before the rest of America does. And secondly, we've also learned that VA can't solve problems alone. So it needs this type of community, this type of effort, federal agencies working together. So thank you for doing this again. Uh, we first noticed the opioid crisis in 2010. So we've been working on this now for seven years and we've seen a 33% reduction in the use of opioids among veterans. But we have a lot more to do we have a lot that we can learn, and we were just pleased to participate here. Thank you. Mr. Secretary, thank you. And, and we, uh, we intend to be coming to visit um, the VA uh, as a commission uh, to talk specifically about the efforts that the VA is making, the successes you've had, and how that can be uh, more broadly applied to the rest of the nation. So um, you all being the canary in the coal mine is a good thing for us, and we don't want to reinvent the wheel. We want to be able to use what you've done, and, and we look forward to working with you, Mr. Secretary. So thank you. I want to turn it over to members of the Commission to make some opening remarks um, on their role here and, and, and their view on what we should be doing. I'll turn first to the Governor of Massachusetts, Governor Charlie Baker. Thank you, Governor. Um, let me just start, first of all, by thanking you and, and thanking the President for giving me this opportunity to serve. Um, I especially appreciate the attendance of both Secretary Shulkin and Secretary Price, as well as other experts in the field here from which we can learn. I, uh, I didn't run for governor to work on this issue. It found me. Uh, I couldn't go to a town meeting. I couldn't go to a diner. I couldn't go to a restaurant without running into somebody who had a story. And, um, and as a result of that, um, we have managed in Massachusetts working on a bipartisan basis to craft pretty comprehensive legislation on the prevention, education, treatment, recovery, and intervention side of things here. But, um, but this issue is persistent, it is determined, and, uh, and it will take everybody's best efforts over a uh, serious period of time to beat it down. And uh, I am very anxious to hear what other people are up to and what they're doing that's working and trying to figure out how we can craft that either into um, a shared effort around best practices at the state level uh, as well as national policy. Thank you, Governor. Appreciate it. I'm also very uh, pleased to have Governor Roy Cooper, the governor of North Carolina, uh, as a member of the commission. Uh, Roy and I have known each other for a number of years and worked together as law enforcement folks, and now as governors. I'll turn it over to you, Roy. Governor Christie, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you to the president and members of the cabinet. I'm hoping that we can use this time to find some consensus, common ground, and 
effective solutions. I served as Attorney General, the top law enforcement officer of North Carolina for 16 years. And we have been fighting this problem. And we have realized that we cannot arrest our way out of this problem, particularly at the user addiction level. We need help from the federal government in stopping drugs like fentanyl and others from coming to, into our country and fighting the drug kingpins and the traffickers. But at the addiction level, we need treatment and prevention. And we're kidding ourselves if we don't think that what is happening over in Congress regarding issues of health care uh, matters to this issue. If we make it harder and more expensive for people to get health care coverage, it's going to make this crisis work. So I'm hoping also that we can find ways, particularly in the Medicaid area, to find effective ways for us to attack this problem. Uh, I look forward to working with the law enforcement community. A lot of good things are happening with diversion. And we also need to look at pharmaceutical companies making generic drugs more tamper resistant and looking at making drugs uh, that do not cause addiction so severely. A lot of issues on the table. Look forward to tackling them. Thank you, Governor. Appreciate it. I just want to turn to Professor Bertha Madras. Bertha is one of the real experts in our country um, on this issue and someone who I've already learned a great deal from and look forward to working with. So I'll turn it over to you, Bertha. Thank you very much. I'm honored to be a member of the President's Commission. I am humbled by the, the magnitude of this crisis, and I'm also very hopeful and optimistic that we can solve it or alleviate it in the short and long term. I'm, I've, I've worn many hats in my life. I'm a neuroscientist by training. I've been at ONDCP as well as uh, an educator. I've never in my life confronted uh, an issue as daunting, as challenging, and also one that has so much opportunity for solution. My underlying philosophy of all is that for every human problem, we have human solutions, and I think this body is going to set the groundwork to solving them. Thank you. Thank you. Bertha, I appreciate it. And uh, lastly, to uh, former Congressman Patrick Kennedy. Um, Patrick has been one of the loudest and most passionate voices on this topic, both in his time in Congress and in his time now in private life. And I'm uh, thrilled for two things. One, to have him on the commission. And two, he lives in New Jersey now. That's right. So that's a good thing. <laughs> as, as any really smart, educated person would do, and Kellyanne understands this, particularly he married a Jersey girl. Um, and so, uh, so it's a really, really good thing, uh, Patrick. So thank you for being on the commission, and I welcome your remarks. Well, thank you very much, Governor. You took my opener out of the way when you mentioned that I married a Jersey girl. Uh, so I'm honored to be on this commission with all of my fellows, and uh, thank you, Governor, for your leadership. It's been extraordinary. I know we've talked before, but everywhere I've been, anyone who's heard that speech you made uh, about a year ago that went viral uh, recognized that you have a unique ability to understand this that many others haven't been able to grasp. Uh, so your leadership on this commission is really exciting for me as an advocate because I know you're not going to mm -hmm. bow to anyone as you have well earned that reputation uh, uh, over and over again. So we're happy that you're our champion on this. Uh, and to the secretaries, uh, Shulkin and uh, my former colleague, uh, Secretary Price, it's an honor to be with you. Uh, I'll just say very quickly, obviously, uh, parity is the big issue for me. Um, I had the honor of co-authoring this legislation that basically said we shouldn't take mental health and addiction and treat it separately. I mean, it's really still treated separately in many cases and unequally, uh, which it's still treated unequally. You just look across the medical a spectrum. You, we do not treat brain illnesses like we do any other set of physical illnesses. This is a historic discrimination that still exists in our country. And I'm excited by the chance to kind of push for ways that we can hold uh, insurance companies more accountable so that the public sector doesn't end up having to pick up the tab. Because it's taxpayers that are picking up the tab when insurance companies continue to push uh, folks with these illnesses off into the public system. Uh, let's understand this is a cost shift uh, that is a windfall for those insurance companies if they can get rid of people who have an underlying mental illness or addiction. So as Governor Cooper said, um, 
you know, parity is key, but we can't celebrate parity if we don't have health insurance. So to the last point he made about uh, Medicaid, it, it is the elephant in the room. It is the largest uh, provider of uh, coverage for people with mental illness and addiction in this country. Um, so we uh, have to mention the fact that any repeal of Medicaid is a repeal of coverage that we currently have out there. I hope the commission can come up with some solutions given whatever happens in the next few weeks on the Hill as to how this nation's gonna to decide to go forward with Medicaid to ensure that we don't step back at just the point where we need to be stepping forward on this terrible epidemic. So Bertha mentioned three hats she uh, wears. I wear a couple other hats, and that is as someone in long-term sobriety who was addicted, uh, still struggles with addiction uh, from opiates. So I know something about this. I've been uh, someone who's received medication-assisted treatment. I'm also someone who's in 12-step recovery. Um, so this is personal for me as it is for everyone else. I also grew up in a family where addiction and alcoholism was rampant. And like today, it was something we never talked about. So I hope that the other part of this, and I had the honor of a meeting with uh, Kellyanne Conway before, is that we can have the president speak about the silence that pervades this issue. Because the biggest way we can move your agenda forward, Secretary Price, in addressing this, and the Commission's agenda, is to have a new attitude towards these as addictions are physical illnesses, not moral failings. And, uh, and that's not going to happen unless we have the bully pulpit speaking loudly on the importance of treating this like we would any other physical illness. Thanks for letting me. Patrick, thank you very much. Here's the way we want to proceed. We have, a, we have nine different uh, representatives today of um, extraordinary groups around this country um, who, are doing, who are doing very important work in this area. Um, what I'd like to do, and I'm going to be strict about this, and I know they've all been instructed about it beforehand, is I'm going to call on you one at a time and, and give you five minutes to make public remarks. Uh, we obviously have taken and are happy to take written remarks from you that are significantly longer for the Commission's consideration, and we invite you to do that and hope that you will. Um, then we'll, um, after all nine of you get a chance to make your remarks, then I'm going to open it up to the Commission members for us to have a dialogue for the rest of the meeting about the issues that you've raised and that are, are in our minds as well. And so um, I'm going to be, um, I'm going to be as, as tough as I can be, while also being New Jersey nice, um, uh, to, uh, to keep us at, uh, at the right pace. I don't know why Price is laughing so hard at that one. Um, but I want to start with Marsha Lee Taylor um, from the Partnership for Drug-Free Kids. Uh, and uh, we're looking forward to hearing from you, Marcia. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much, um, Governor Christie and members of the Commission. Thank you for inviting me to testify today. I'm Marcia Lee Taylor. I'm President and CEO of the Partnership for Drug-Free Kids, a 30-year-old national nonprofit organization dedicated to supporting families struggling with their son or daughter's substance use. It is said that having a child is to forever have your heart go walking around outside your body. So as we gather to talk about the country's opioid epidemic, what we see at the partnership are not just the 144 or more individuals who lose their lives every day to overdose, but the families that surround them, families that have lost their heart to a loved one's disease. Nothing tears apart the fabric of a family quite like having a child who is struggling with addiction. Parents are usually overwhelmed by feelings of guilt, shame, and fear. From the beginning, parents encounter hurdles. When they suspect something is wrong and Google for answers, they discover there's very little reliable scientific evidence uh, available, information available, a far cry from the abundant resources for all other health issues and diseases. And that's where the partnership comes in. We're dedicated solely to supporting families, and we've been on the front lines of this issue for three decades. The partnership empowers families with critical information and support in a variety of ways. Through our national toll-free helpline, 1-855-DRUG-FREE, and new online live chat service, we've connected 10,000 families to bilingual master's level counselors who help them develop a plan to address their child's substance use. With our national network of parent coaches, nearly 200 volunteers strong in 2017, and our new Ask a Coach feature, we connect parents to others who have been there and can help them learn how to love their child through this crisis and understand, importantly, that tough love and rock bottom are not the only viable options. We have an active network of nearly 180,000 families, and through our website, drugfree.org, 
We provide 5 million families a year with the latest cutting-edge scientific information distilled into actionable tips and tools to help them understand the disease of addiction, to better navigate the treatment, treatment system, and get their child to accept help. And thanks to our national and local media partners and local alliances through the country, throughout the country, including the Partnership for Drug-Free New Jersey, the Massachusetts Inter Interscholastic Athletic Association, and North Carolina's Insight Human Services, we receive approximately $100 million a year in donated time to run PSAs to let parents know that there is help for their loved one and they can find support at the partnership. And working with private sector partners like Google and Facebook, we help reach parents as they actively search for help online. In all of these tools, we use evidence-based concepts such as community reinforcement and family training, otherwise known as CRAFT, and motivational interviewing to help parents obtain the best possible outcomes for getting their child into treatment and on the path to recovery. One of our parent coaches, Denise Mariano from New Jersey, is here with us today. And when Denise be began looking for help for her son, she sent emails to dozens of organizations, um, and only the partnership responded. And we responded with resources, tools, and strategies, and perhaps most of all, hope for Denise and her family. And I'm happy to say that hope was not in vain. Denise's son, Mike, has been in recovery for four years. And then, now Denise is giving back and providing other families the same hope that she found with us. We are really proud of the work that we're doing and the difference that we're making, yet we know that there's so much more work to be done, which makes the work of this commission so vital. Of the array of policy options um, that, are, that are before you, we believe that there are a few that hand, uh, there are a handful that rise to the top. One, we need to ensure that there's a dedicated funding stream at the federal and state level to support families. Too often, families get left out of the equation, and programs like the partnerships fall into the canyon between prevention and treatment. We need to prioritize empowering families to intervene early, teaching them that they don't need to wait for rock bottom, helping them to develop a plan to get their loved one into treatment, and learning how to support their son or daughter in recovery. Two, the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act must be enforced. Despite the fact the law passed nearly a decade ago, parents continue to struggle with obtaining the cover coverage entitled to them under the act. Virtually all of our parent coaches have been denied coverage by their insurance companies, and many are in financial ruin because of it, blowing credit and raiding a sibling's college savings fund. The issue is incredibly raw for them because many of them never recover from the financial damage, and others blame the lack of coverage for their child's ongoing struggle, or in some cases, even their death. Three, addiction treatment needs to enter the medical mainstream. Too many healthcare providers are not trained about addiction in medical school, are not prepared to screen for, identify, and treat a patient with a substance use disorder. We need robust training programs in every medical school in the country, incentives for doctors to specialize in addiction medicine, and a better understanding of the importance of medication-assisted treatment, as well as a commitment by the private sector to develop even more medications to treat this disease. Overdose is the leading cause of accidental death in this country, and it deserves a full-throated public health and medical response. Fourth, the response to the addiction crisis needs to be coordinated and comprehensive. In the two decades I've been involved in federal drug policy matters, there's been a tendency to pick a favorite approach, law enforcement, prevention, treatment, recovery, to, and to underestimate the importance of a coordinated strategy. The Office of National Drug Control Policy was created to ensure that the National Drug Control Strategy was coordinated among 16 separate bureaucracies and that the counter-drug budget got appropriate attention in each agency. Consideration should be given to making the director of ONDCP a member of the president's cabinet to reflect the gravity of the current crisis and the importance of having the highest levels of government working together to address it. In this time of bitter partisan divide, addressing the opiate epidemic is a rare instance of bipartisan agreement. Together, we have an opportunity to show that government can tackle the most difficult of issues, reverse an epidemic, and most importantly, bring hope to families desperate to save a loved one. The partnership stands ready to help in this effort. Thank you for inviting me to testify, and I look forward to any questions you might have. Thank you, Marcia. I appreciate it very much. Uh, next, we have Dr. Mitchell Rosenthal from the National Council on Alcoholism and Drug Dependence. Dr. Rosenthal. Governor, thank you, and thank you for your inspired leadership and passionate leadership. I, I think it has uh, been very, very helpful. 
As Deputy Chairman of the National Council on Alcoholism and Drug Dependence, it is a privilege for me to share with the Commission the experience of our organization's affiliates that serve more than 90 cities and towns throughout the country. <clears throat> As a psychiatrist and the founder of Phoenix House, I've been treating addiction for more than half a century. At the Rosenthal Center for Addiction Studies, which I now head, we have been uh, uh, tracking the opioid addiction epidemic and assessing efforts to contain it. What our affiliates report and the frightening statistics of the CDC confirm is that it, the addiction crisis of today is likely to be the most deadly drug epidemic in this nation's history. We are engulfed in a perfect storm of disabling forces. The drug trade on the dark web, the availability of hyperpotent synthetic opioids, and the despair that prevails in small towns and cities where the factories are closed, the stores on Main Street are empty, and the mall that replaced them is closing too. The crisis is not only a threat to life killing, close to 60,000 a year, and sharply raising the death, death rate for Americans in the prime of their life. It is also tearing at the social fabric of the nation and spreading a dark cloud of fear, frustration, and anger over cities, suburbs, and rural areas that had been relatively untouched by drug abuse before. And let me be blunt. Today, there is no, not nearly enough drug treatment capacity in America to help most of the victims of the epidemic. I am particularly concerned about the lack of long-term treatment and the treatment necessary to repair lives that have been shattered by addiction. <clears throat> Faced with the ferocious escalation of opioid addiction, NCADD affiliates have mounted programs of awareness, prevention, counseling, and referral for populations far more heterogeneous than any they'd ever seen before. For today, everyone is at risk and every family prey to loss. Most terrifying is the reality that nothing we're doing today has been able to hold the spread of opioid addiction. Controlling the prescription op opioid medication has not done, done so. Prescription monitoring programs, strict limits on the number of pills physicians can prescribe, and the CDC pain management guidelines seem to have capped usage of prescribed opioid uh, medications. But overdose deaths from heroin and highly potent synthetics like fentanyl have gone through the roof, especially with young adults. Equipping first responders with naloxone, the overdose reversal medication, is a key feature in just about every community's response. But while the medication can avert an overdose fatality, there's no guarantee that the life that's been saved from one overdose will survive the next one. Most troubling to the NCADD affiliates is the difficulty they have in uh, finding referrals for treatment. Adequate treatment resources are scarce, and there's enormous disparity between one state and another in treatment and prevention services that are available. In large measure, it is the states that determine what and where treatment and prevention services are delivered, but they look to the federal government for much of the funding. I'd like to point out three areas that I hope you'll thoughtfully consider. The most obvious of these is the future of Medicaid. Under the American Health Care Act, as passed by the House of Representatives, 14 million of today's Medicaid patients will be uninsured by the start of 2020. And some 30 percent of Medicaid patients today are being treated for substance abuse and mental health issue. A second concern is the rapid proliferation of medically assisted treatment programs without, without the use of counseling and behavioral therapies. Bear in mind that the key word in medically assisted treatment is assisted, for the practice is de designed to employ medications in combination with counseling and behavioral therapies. The goal is not just to change the drugs one is taking, but to change you and your way of life. Often lost in the rush to get buprenorphine medication to as many patients as possible are the behavioral components that are needed. My third concern is for the needs of the most vulnerable and needful substance abusers. These are the men and women with few social or economic resources whose addiction has proven most disabling. 
essential to their recovery is long-term residential treatment of a kind that makes possible a new level of self-awareness and the acquisition of social and vocational skills, along with the sense of self-worth and responsibility that are the bedrock of sustained recovery. These programs like Integrity House, Phoenix House, Samaritan Daytop, Odyssey, and Delancey Street are just such uh, good examples. Few states today, though, have any long-term residential treatment of the type mentioned. What we see all too frequently for those most vulnerable addicts fortunate enough to find treatment services is a disastrous pattern of serial admissions to short-term programs. The pattern may start with an overdose and rescue, followed by detoxification, then a short period of residential treatment, and return to the community. A pause, and then the same sequence is repeated again. And again, in so many tragic cases, the end comes with a final overdose. If the Commission does nothing else, I would hope your report recommends the expansion of true long-term treatment, treatment that lasts as long as needed. It will actually save money by reducing the number of multiple admissions, and it will truly save lives rather than today's practice that so often amounts to postponing death. I'd like to end, though, with a hopeful story, if I could. Um, there is, was a young woman several years ago, African-American, who got deeply into drugs and was on the streets of the Bronx. There was a young boy in New Jersey who ended up on the streets. They both, through different mechanisms, ended up in Phoenix House and were there for two years, then went to community college. She, Sheila, was a year ahead of Michael. She finished community college and went to Harvard Divinity School. Michael, a year later, finished, and Sheila said to Michael, why don't you think about Harvard Divinity School? He went to Harvard Divinity School, went back to New York, worked at the Innocence Project and some other places, and then applied to Harvard Law School. He went to Harvard Law School, graduated, and is now practicing at a white shoe firm in Manhattan. I saw them both within the last two weeks. Um, there was a wonderful graduation of one of the programs at St. John the Divine, and there was Sheila in uniform. Uh, it was very touching. Uh, I saw Michael uh, a, two days ago at a board meeting of Phoenix House, where he is now a board member. Uh, it, uh, treatment works, and, and we just have to provide it smartly. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you very much for that story as well, and for your testimony. Um, next, I want to turn to Dr. Joe Parks from the National Council for Behavioral Health. Doctor. Thank you, Governor. Uh, my name is Joe Parks, and I'm a board-certified psychiatrist. I'm the medical director at the National Council for Behavioral Health. However, I also treat patients with mental illness and addiction on a weekly basis. My brother struggled all his life with addiction and with mental illness. I previously was head of Missouri's Mental Health Agency, and I've been also in charge of Missouri's Medicaid Agency recently. I want to thank you for the opportunity to testify. Our families. Our friends and our citizens are dying at an increasing rate of the two great epidemics of our generation, the opiate addiction epidemic and the suicide epidemic. And it's not always easy to tell which one somebody died of. There's an intermix. Both continue to increase at alarming rates because we've not dedicated the same attention, effort, and resources that we did to the other great killers that we've successfully fought back and got some control on. Things like polio, HIV, heart disease, stroke, and cancer. Every day, an estimated 91 yeah. Americans die of opiate overdose, and 121 die by suicide. We can and must do better. We must muster the same determination to make significant changes of statute, practice, and funding in fighting the opiate and suicide epidemics that we successfully used to combat previous epidemics. We must be vigilant in our communities. Every American should know how to recognize when someone is in distress from an addiction or a mental illness, and should know how to ensure that they can get help. 
To this end, federal and local support for mental health first aid must be continued and expanded. Many persons with opiate addiction also face mental illness, so successful treatment of addiction often requires concurrent treatment of both conditions. In the epidemiological catchment area study, an estimated 72% of people with a drug use disorder had at least one co-occurring mental illness. In opiate addiction, rates of lifetime depression range from 16 to 75%. To fight an epidemic, you must systematically screen for the illness and ensure those who screen positive have prompt access to effective treatment. We must monitor and screen for addictive disorders. Screening, brief intervention, and referral to treatment, also known as SBIRT, is an evidence-based practice used to identify, reduce, and prevent problematic use, abuse, and dependence on alcohol and other addictive drugs, including opiates. SBIRT should always be a covered benefit, and all hospitals, emergency rooms, and clinics should provide it systematically. Everyone must have health care coverage for addictions and mental illness. We must redouble our efforts to expand affordable coverage and require that all forms of coverage have comprehensive parity requirements that are systematically and firmly monitored and enforced. Any healthcare legislation should expand parity requirements to all forms of coverage. Not all fall under parity right now. There's some holes still. Healthcare legislation should mandate coverage for addiction and mental illness. Now, enforcement of parity must also include payment and rate parity. Many addiction and mental health treatment provider organizations report that they limit addiction and mental health treatment services due to the rates being so low that they lose money and must cover those losses from other treatment lines of business. Some hospitals and clinics have closed their mental illness and addiction services due to inadequate rates to cover the cost of providing the treatment. Mental illness and addiction treatment rates must be reset to be consistent with actual market costs of providing the treatment. Medicaid is the largest national payer for addiction and mental health treatment. There's no larger payer. To successfully fight back these epidemics of addiction and suicide, Medicaid must continue as an entitlement. Since the majority of increased opiate deaths and suicide occur in young and middle-aged adults, which is the expansion population, the Medicaid expansions must be maintained and completed. Medication is proven effective, as has been noted by the other experts in treating opiate addiction, but they can't always get these medications. Those drugs like methadone, buprenorphine, naltrexone, including long-acting Vivitrol, need to be categorized as a protected medication class in Medicaid and in Medicare Part D, requiring their open access on formularies so doctors can prescribe them. All people need to have access to clinicians who know how to treat and are willing to treat mental illness and addictions. We must expand the Certified Community Behavioral Health Center program, which provides that, beyond the current demonstration, which is limited to only eight states and only two years. Your great state of New Jersey is participating, Governor. This will ensure access to care coordination to evidence-based outpatient treatment capacity that includes medication-assisted treatment. We must expand the Data 2000 waivers to continue recruitment and training of physicians, physician assistants, nurse practitioners, and to incentivize the uptake in buprenorphine prescribing with continued post-training support. We need the DEA to follow through on its telemedicine guidelines that they have been promised and a certification process to prescribe addiction medica treatment medications via telemedicine to broaden access. And frankly, DEA certification to prescribe controlled substances should really require some continuing medical education. So if I can prescribe a controlled substance, I have to know something about preventing, screening, diagnosing, and treating addiction to prescription medications. We must continue to build alliances between treatment providers and law enforcement to create drug treatment programs and to assure appropriate sentencing for addicted individuals. We need collaborative deflection programs to prevent entry into criminal justice and get people treatment first. We must develop and fund a comprehensive continuum of care that includes short-term residential and detox, longer-term residential for people with chronic relapses like were just described, recovery housing and other recovery support services to support outpatient treatment. Finally, I want to speak individually and not on behalf of the National Council. We must change 42 CFR Part 2 and any other state law that put more restrictions on addiction treatment information than on other health care information. The only additional restriction should be not allowing addiction treatment information to be used for arrest or prosecution or other punitive actions. We can never succeed in fighting any epidemic by hiding information about the disease and treatment history from health care providers. 
Keeping a prior diagnosis and treatment history of addictive disorders secret deprives the person of the extra care and attention that any healthcare professional would routinely give to someone who has a known prior condition. That makes early detection and treatment relapse much less likely. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you for your efforts. Thank you, Dr. Parks. Appreciate that very much. Uh, <clears throat> next one, I introduce Gary Mendel from Shatterproof. I had the opportunity uh, to meet with Gary uh, in my offices in New Jersey uh, to talk about the efforts we're making in New Jersey. And I um, was really incredibly impressed by your efforts, Gary. I want to welcome you and oh, welcome you to share your, your thoughts. Good afternoon, everyone. should turn on your microphone there. There you go. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Governor Christie, and um, for your kind invitation here. It's an honor to be here with you and your commission and, and really everyone in this room, so thank you. Um, my name is Gary Mendel, and by way of background, unlike most in the room here today, uh, I spent the most, most of my career uh, leading and running businesses. My life was going well until my, until my older, older son, Brian, uh, became addicted to opioids. Through eight different treatment programs over eight years, side by side with my son, I experienced firsthand what we call treatment in our country. As hard as Brian tried, on October 20th, 2011, I received a phone call in the middle of the night letting me know that my son had just died. He was 25 years old. But even more tragic, touching on something Congressman Kennedy just said, it wasn't just addiction that took my son's life. It was a feeling of shame that he had every, every morning when he opened his eyes, of keeping everything internalized and feeling like the outcast that caused him to wake up that morning, research suicide notes, and take his own life. In the months that followed, it haunted me knowing how many other families were suffering this tragedy. And even worse, that NIH funding had created a wealth of knowledge that had proven to reduce the number of our loved ones who would ever become addicted, and also increased the number of those who were addicted to successful, successful recovery. But I was shocked learning that most of this research was not being implemented. I simply just couldn't believe it. I decided to leave my business and form our national nonprofit, Shatterproof, whose sole mission is to spare families of the devastation of this disease. I miss my son desperately. However, today, I'm excited. Excited to be here with all of you and share recommendations that I know it will work and spare other families. Given our time constraints, I will suggest only seven evidence-based rec recommendations in my remarks. Th three related to treatment, two related to prevention, and two miscellaneous. However, we've also prepared in writing several additional recommendations related to FDA uh, labeling and prescriber education. While ending this, this epidemic will be difficult, cutting this by two-thirds in just a few years and saving countless lives is possible. And I'd like to sh provide some recommendations how. But before I do so, I'd like to begin by emphasizing three points. Number one, we believe our federal government should limit the circumstances in which it regulates our states. Having said that, there is no question that federal involvement at this time can save tens of thousands of lives. In this regard, several of our recommendations are patterned after what our federal government did years ago to ensure that states drop their speed limit to 55 miles per hour, tying highway funding to state compliance. Number two, a majority of our recommendations do not require a single penny, rather immediate and efficient business-like implementation. For those few that do require funding, the return on investment is far greater than its cost. Number three, when I use the, fra the phrase federal funding throughout my recommendations, I am, ref I am referring to four sources of federal funding. SAMHSA block grants, Comprehensive Addiction and Recovery Act, the second installment, 500,000 of the 21st Century Cures Act, and other funding channels yet to be determined. With this background, um, I'd like to go through uh, my recommendations. Number one, <clears throat> end once and for all the treatment gap. Three levers, close the gap of prescribers who are licensed to prescribe buprenorphine by eliminating the required eight hours of training. This could be done quickly and will not cost a single penny. 
Number two, close the gap of specialists who can effectively provide evidence-based behavioral therapies, therapies by mobilizing a federal emergency training program, a program to be developed within 60 days from today, fully, fully implemented by December 31st, 2018. We would do this if this were an infectious disease. Number three, close the gap of financing by having a federal government for an interim period only pay for all aspects of medication assisted therapy for every single American who doesn't have insurance. Again, for an interim period. Additionally, eliminate all prior authorizations in all insurance plans for any and all aspects of medication assisted therapy. This all can be done by the end of this year. Recommendation number two, develop the infrastructure to ensure that all treatment delivered is evidence based. NIH, the good news is NIH sponsored research has already provided the knowledge to, to significantly improve outcomes. Knowing this, our organization Shatterproof recently started a process to implement the recommendations in the recent Surgeon General report and the 2006 Institute of Medicine report implementing the quality of health care for mental health and substance use conditions. Pursuant to IOM recommendation 4.3, Secretary Price, we ask HHS to join us as our partner to accelerate this process. Recommendation number three, broad access and use of naloxone, fast, two levers. Federal funding to each state to be conditioned upon that state requiring every responder, excuse me, every first responder in that state to be trained and stocked with naloxone by September 1st of this year, or federal funding in those four levels, levers will not be given to that state for next year. Number two, federal funding, again, those four levers, to each state to be conditioned upon that state complying with the nine best practices related to naloxone that have been documented by Shatterproof, the National Institutes of, excuse me, HHS, and our experts. This will not cost the federal government one penny. Number four, broad adoption of the CDC prescribing guidelines, fast. We recommend federal government, the federal government to develop a robust goal setting and reporting infrastructure to drive local prescriber and state accountability. This would include an analysis of new, new patient prescribing that is outside the CDC guideline to set a benchmark for each state, stringent goals to reduce inappropriate prescribing, clinical education and interventions targeted to physicians and states with the greatest levels of inappropriate prescribing. Results published annually and publicly within 60 days of the end of each year to drive accountability. Federal funding to each state to be contingent upon the achieve, achieving the goals defined in this program. The cost of this is negligible. Number five, full utilization of prescription drug monitoring programs. Fast. In 2015, patient history was not checked by the prescriber in four out of five times that the patient received an opioid. Four out of five times. Half of our states, pharmacies upload the information a week later versus a day later. Interstate sharing is horrendously low. This can change within months, but with one lever. The federal government conditioning, federal funding, the four levers I mentioned earlier, upon states adopting legislation and or regulations by February 2018 that comply with the 12 best practices documented by Shatterproof, its experts, all drawn from HHS research. This will not cost one single penny. Number six, health insurance, medication, excuse me, Medicaid, essential health benefits, parity, parity, parity. I think others will talk about it, but that category cannot be underemphasized. Number seven, it was talked about earlier, but I'd just like to close with it. Reducing the shame and stigma associated with this disease. And the most powerful resource we have is the, bu have is the bully pulpit of President Trump. And so we ask all those in, the, in this room who can influence pe President Trump to use his influence to get this talked about and to be treated like any other physical disease. Every morning, I wake up thinking about the serenity prayer. The serenity to accept what I cannot change, and the courage to change the things we can. Our society must find the serenity to accept the lives that have already been lost. However, working together, Republicans and Democrats, 
State officials, government officials, businesses, families, we can accomplish this. We can save countless lives of those who have yet to be lost. We can and must do this. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Gary, for your remarks. Next, I want to turn to Jessica Nickel from the Addiction Policy Forum. Jessica, thank you for coming today. Appreciate you being here. Thank you, Governor Christie and members of the Commission for having us here today and for focusing on this important issue. My name is Jessica Nickel, and I'm the president of the Addiction Policy Forum. Um, I've been in this field for about 26 years now. I started in prevention and have worked in treatment and criminal justice, um, and I founded the Addiction Policy Forum uh, to focus on a comprehensive response, uh, prevention, treatment, recovery support, overdose reversal, law enforcement <laughs> strategies, and criminal justice reform, and also to be a voice for the families that are impacted. Um, I, I love my job. I get to work every day with families, and we have about four million families in our network that take the, um, the darkest, hardest moments of their life and turn it into change and fire in their belly to um, help their communities, their neighborhoods, uh, so other families don't have to endure the same devastation. Um, we're grateful for your focus on this and for the Commission's work um, on this crisis, and it, it is a crisis. Mm -hmm. Every day in America, we lose, uh, lose 144 people to drug overdoses. That's equivalent to um, uh, two sold-out 747s crashing every single week for an entire year. Or put another way, imagine a sold-out Yankee Stadium and losing everyone in that stadium over the course of a year. Um, and we have um, uh, launched an awareness campaign to give a voice for our families, and you have some of these in your packets of information. And I wanted to um, share a little bit um, uh, of a reminder of the families that are at the epicenter of this epidemic. Um, this is, is Courtney, Courtney Griffin. Um, Courtney's parents lost her at just 20 years old. Um, her dad, dad, Doug, describes Courtney as a shining star. The room lit up when she walked in and everyone loved her. He writes, we were told that because it is not a matter of life or death, there would be no coverage for treatment by their insurance provider. On the advice of local authorities, we asked her to leave our home and cancel her insurance, and by doing this, she would be homeless and could be eligible to receive treatment. Courtney died alone, away from our home, on the day before she was scheduled to enter drug treatment. Um, this is Dylan and, and Matthew. Um, and Dylan and Matthew's mom, Denise, describes her boys as the loves of her life. Uh, she lost them both uh, to um, opioid use disorder, to drug overdoses. And she says to us, um, my boys had a bright future ahead of them. Be because of their illness and lack of adequate treatment and medical coverage, their lives were cut tragically short. Had they suffered from diabetes or skin cancer, they would have been provided the medical care and attention that they needed to live a full life. And this is, um, this is April and her daughter. And April's mom, Annie, tells us that the hardest thing that she's ever done is to tell her four-year-old uh, granddaughter that her mommy had died and what that meant. <coughs> we love and miss my beautiful daughter every day and will for the rest of our lives. And this is um, Terry and Annette, my parents. I've been in this field for a really long time for personal reason, and I know firsthand um, the impact that this has on families. Both of my parents struggled with heroin use disorder, which for me and my little sister meant homelessness and hunger and living on the streets and foster care and eventually being placed with our grandparents. Um, it is, um, it's hard to sort of um, underestimate the impact on, on children that are impacted by parental substance use um, and all of the instability and the uncertainty that means. Um, my, um, my father never found a way out of that disease and he died way too young at the age of 48. My mom did find help um, and through a drug court before it was a drug court, right? It was just a, a judge that really cared and helped her to make a change in her life through a methadone clinic and the combination of recovery support services. And she had 19 years in recovery when I lost her, way too young at the age of 50 because of the long-term health impacts that opioid use disorder has, even when you're in recovery. Um, and I, um, uh, every day, sort of do this work in sort of their memory. Um, and and very, I'm very proud of the, my mom and the work that she did to get to that point of having her 19 years, two, two weeks short of her 20th anniversary. Um, and we know right now that we, um, 
have an incredible treatment gap in this country. Of the 21 million people that need treatment help, only 10% will receive it. Can you imagine if 10% of cancer or Alzheimer's patients receive treatment? Just 10%. Um, but we, we can do better. Uh, us at the, we at the Addiction Policy Forum, we envision a world where fewer lives are lost and help exists for the millions of Americans that are impacted, and it is millions. And we envision, we, we sort of ask on a daily basis, what if, right, what if? What if we treated addiction across this nation like a disease with continuous individualized treatment and follow-up for each patient? What if every child in our nation's schools had the adequate dosage of prevention starting early and followed up at home? One of the most important things is delaying the age of onset for alcohol and marijuana use, and we need to do a better job of telling parents that. What if we had robust services for those in recovery, from recovery housing and schools to community services? What if every patient who needed it had access to the three medications that have been approved by the FDA for treating opioid use disorder, methadone, buprenorphine, and naltrexone? What if we treated individuals with substance use disorders through our health care system instead of through our criminal justice system, then shackling people with criminal justice histories for the rest of their lives? And what if we use science to inform our response and measure how successful we are in stopping this deadly disease? We're working to advance, advance each of these areas every day at the Addiction Policy Forum. And in our written statement, we have over 60 recommendations, but they fall in uh, seven key buckets that we think of as sort of the organizing tool to understand the full comprehensive response that we need to do a better job because we can do better. And those buckets are overdose interventions, treatment, advancing treatment, prevention, protecting children impacted by parental substance use disorder. Really, really important that we don't forget about going a little upstream to talk about the kids that are impacted, kids like me. And there are ways and there's lots of hope on how we can intervene to help them, but we need to start working on that today. Um, expanding recovery support services and reframing our criminal justice system. So I'll only give you a one or two, because I'm pretty sure I don't have time for 63 uh, recommendations, but uh, yeah, pretty <laughs> certain. <laughs> um, our our uh, highest priority right now is on the overdose intervention side. Naloxone is so important, equipping our first responders, our hospitals with Narcan, huge priority, but using the moment of intervention in an overdose, and we know that those that have had a non-fatal overdose are at the most risk um, for another overdose and death. Um, so making sure that we're working with our states and jurisdictions to implement interventions and protocols um, from emergency rooms and health systems to our first responders, um, uh, educating and training families, this is our top priority right now as an organization, um, and I think it is the most needed as we look at this worsening epidemic. Um, and our recommendations in this department uh, are to, for overdose patients in emergency rooms, to ensure each patient leaves with a treatment plan and a warm handoff to behavioral health. Train clinicians and staff to offer MAT and provide naloxone. Conduct trainings to discuss with patients how to reduce risk for future overdose. We can't get them into treatment if we can't save them in the first place. And then the other recommendation in this bucket is to change HIPAA laws to allow for family notification after an overdose reversal. My mom, Amy, who lost her son, Emmett, um, found out that after she lost him that there had been multiple overdose reversals with no family notification and no ability to use that as a moment for the family to come in and wrap around their loved one. And I, yeah. I think he, he was 19, so just outside of sort of being an adult, but, uh, but still being in, 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 in need of that. Um, We've heard from some press reports that this is an area that the commission is looking at, and we fully support that, that change. It's something you can do that would save millions of lives. The second bucket is resources for families, and, and Mar Marcia mentioned this earlier. Our biggest gap um, is helping families in crisis. And I try to describe to folks, because uh, I've lost a total of six family members to this disease. It's a whole generation of my family that was just wiped out. And when you are in the middle of it, it feels like you're drowning. You, and there's no, it's hard to find where to go or who can help you or how you navigate your way out of this. Um, so if, if we can do a much better job and through awareness campaigns and using the services and resources that are out there to connect families in crisis with the help that they need to get their loved ones in treatment and have that long-term uh, treatment plan in place. 
The third bucket is to advance treatment. I, I, I mentioned that we have an enormous treatment gap, and there's a lot of things that we can do to close that in short order. Our first recommendation is to commission an IOM report um, on how to restructure the treatment system to address the pervasive uh, systemic issues between workforce shortages, billing models, lack of training, um, getting training into medical schools, you name it, to really look at this from a broader lens. Our second recommendation is to, to remove addiction from the IMD exclusion. It shouldn't have been there in the first place, and it's a very, very simple, um, common sense way to deal with our uh, treatment gap. The third is to educate providers, patients, health plans, payers, uh, everyone, on all FDA-approved medication-assisted treatment options, and to make sure that we make those available. And then the, in the treatment sort of bucket, but still in the research, we need to invest in more research to have more medications and more technology and more interventions. We want to cure. We want what other diseases fight for in terms of more resources. We want to be partners with our white lab coats and in industry to help us do a better job here. And then the fourth bucket is create recovery-ready communities. Our research and our clin like clinicians are pretty clear that uh, folks need a three to five year recovery plan. That's three to five years that you need to wrap folks up um, that have a substance use disorder. And to do that, we need to have all of the programs in place to support recovery um, in every community. And in our written testimony, we lay out 10 key components of a recovery-ready community, and it's our vision that every single county in America will have all 10 of those. On the prevention side, we know that 90% of adolescents, um, or we know that addiction starts um, in adolescence for 90% of people. So investing in prevention is worth it um, and incredibly important. Our two top um, recommendations there are to invest in prevention in schools to require it and use some of the evidence-based programs that are already out there like strengthening families and life skills. They're there, NIDA has great evidence around them and getting them um, to disseminate things like uh, assemblies and, and whatnot, but those don't work. So making sure that we're being clearer with our schools on the do's and don'ts and giving them the evidence behind, behind what they can implement. And the second area, which is a little bit in that canyon between early intervention and prevention, but to implement student assistance programs in every school to make sure that we're intervening early. Addiction isn't very different from other diseases. We need early detection and early intervention to have better patient outcomes. And student assistance programs are a key element in that. That's when this disease begins in adolescence. I have to ask you to wrap up, Jessica. All right. Um, the two other uh, um, quick buckets are one, we need to protect, protect children impacted by parental substance use disorder. Um, kids like me can turn out great, but we just need to invest in them and invest in them early. Um, and then finally, I think uh, we need to work to reframe our criminal justice system. Um, we are recommending and working really hard on the sequential intercept model to have interventions in every point of the criminal justice system, not just one or two. Um, and it's something that uh, I think can have huge in, uh, return on investment um, everywhere from arrest to prosecution, probation, prison and jail, and, and reentry. And we're here as a partner uh, to you as you work on these things. Good. Appreciate your testimony and your commitment to the issue very much. Um, next, we'll go to Dr. Kelly Clark. Uh, Dr. Clark is from the American Society of Addiction Medicine. Dr. Clark, thank you for being here today. I look forward to hearing from you. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Dr. Kelly Clark, the president of ASAM, or the American Society of Addiction Medicine. We represent over 4,500 physicians uh, and other clinicians who specialize in the treatment of addiction. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today, for your work on the panel, and for the commitment that's shown on behalf of the administration uh, being here with your support today. Uh, I'm pleased to present our society's recommendations for both immediate actions and long-term strategies that the federal government can pursue uh, to make a measurable and meaningful impact on the opioid epidemic. There are many issues I could speak to on mental health and addiction today, uh, but I am going to speak specifically around the opioid epidemic. Overdoses and deaths are at an all-time high, and unfortunately, we expect those rates to continue to increase. Let me be clear. We know how to handle this epidemic. Doing more of what's not working will not stop these deaths. We must stop doing what doesn't work and focus our resources on what does. To rein in the death rates, begin to build, bend this mortality curve downward, we need to focus our efforts and resources on three primary areas, evidence-based treatment, evidence-based prevention, and workforce development. 
To reduce overdose deaths, we must ensure that people with addiction can, radically, uh, can readily access evidence-based addiction treatments. Building more beds won't stop these deaths. It will divert scarce resources away from approaches that have been proven to have far better results. When it comes to opioid addiction, the most effective treatment options we have involve the use of medications in combination with specific psychosocial interventions to support recovery. When we say treatment works, we're not referring to every approach that claims to be treatments. We're doctors. We're referring to those interventions, like medications, that have scientific evidence to support their effectiveness. Importantly, sending patients to inpatient care and discharging them without ongoing medication actually leads to an increased risk of death. What works for alcohol doesn't work for opioid addiction. Our neighbors, our families, our communities, they need to know what they should look for in addiction treatment services. Therefore, we recommend that the CDC launch a national public education campaign the campaign should carry the messages that addiction is a chronic brain disease and that there are evidence-based medical treatments available to treat opioid addiction. Only the federal government has the capacity and the reach to raise public awareness effectively. We saw this in the 1980s with the CDC's America Responds to AIDS public information campaign and the distribution of Understanding AIDS, a brochure that was delivered to every residential mailing address in the United States. Overdose deaths due to opioids have surpassed deaths at the height of the AIDS epidemic. And yet we have not seen similar efforts to educate the public about the disease of addiction or the treatment they should seek. In addition to public education, we need healthcare systems in which evidence-based treatment is paid for appropriately. The federal government should work with payers and purchasers, including CMS, private insurers, and employers, to make sure that they're covering and actively paying for evidence-based care and are not paying for, quote, treatment that is not evidence-based. We throw away far too much public and private money on spa-like, quote, treatment programs or programs whose philosophies are not aligned with the science. We must have parity in the coverage of mental health and addiction services with coverage of other medical conditions, and we should ensure that the same high-quality medical care is available for our citizens with opioid addiction as is available to treat their heart disease. In addition to these broad and systemic uh, efforts, the federal government should make near-term policy changes to expand access to evidence-based treatment. First, we should direct and incentivize states to use the second installment of the CURES money to fund treatment at programs that meet evidence-based standards, level of care standards as defined by the ASAM criteria, and that meet the evidence-based standards as outlined by the ASAM National Practice Guidelines. The ASM criteria are a validated uh, tools. They help match patients with the correct level of care based on their uh, disease severity and will help ensure that this funding is used in the most clinically sound, effective, and efficient way. The guideline summarizes the evidence available on the proper use of medications uh, to treat opioid addiction and offers clinical guidance to healthcare providers to support these decision makings. It also provides information for patients and their families and communities on what they should expect from treatment. Secondly, we need to permanently authorize buprenorphine prescribing authority for nurse practitioners and physician assistants. We know what treatment works. We must insist that Americans receive the proper care to save their lives. The Commission, we believe, should champion evidence-based prevention programs to reduce opiate misuse and prevent addiction. SAMHSA maintains a national registry of evidence-based programs and practices. Funding and technical assistance should be made available to choose those evidence-based prevention programs shown to be most effective that can be efficiently replicated and then rapidly scaled across the country. We must stop spending scarce resources on programs that don't work, and we must stop piloting new programs when we know what does work. We have the prevention science. Let's leverage it. Finally, the current addiction tra treatment gap will never be closed with our current addiction treatment workforce. 
It is imperative that our nation invest in training opportunities for clinicians seeking to specialize in addiction treatment, as well as for primary care providers to be able to effectively screen patients, engage them in treatment, and manage less complex patients. To this end, we recommend that the administration work with Congress immediately to fully fund the $10 million in funding through Section 9022 of the 21st Century Cures Act, which authorizes the Secretary to establish a training demonstration program within HRSA, awarding grants for medical residents and fellows to train and practice psychiatry and addiction medicine in underserved community-based settings. Secondly, we strongly urge the administration to identify robust and ongoing funding opportunities that can be used to support addiction specialist training programs to build an adequate workforce to have substantial and sustained impact on this epidemic. We increased our infectious disease specialists during the AIDS epidemic. We must take the same approach now. And finally, we recommend that the administration submit, uh, solicit commitments for medical, nursing, dental, pharmacy, and other clinical programs on increasing curriculum time devoted to addiction screening and treatment, safe prescribing, and pain management. In closing, thank you again for the opportunity to share ACM's perspective and recommendations for stopping this epidemic. Addiction is a disease, not a decision. We need to harness the full strength of our federal resources to maximize to access to evidence-based prevention and treatment to stem the tide of deaths while investing in robust and highly trained clinical workforce to meet our nation's ongoing needs. Again, let me be clear. Building more beds won't stop the deaths. Paying for more ineffective programs won't stop the deaths. There will always be more to learn about the brain, and more research will lead to improved understanding of the very best ways to treat and prevent addiction. But the basics are well known. We must focus our health system resources and scale what we know works. The physicians of ASAM stand ready to help this commission, this administration, and this Congress to end this epidemic. I'll look forward to your questions. Thank you. <coughs> Governor, thank you very much. Uh, a few years back, I had the honor of serving on your task force you had in New Jersey addressing this issue, working out of your single state authority, and uh, appreciate that opportunity as well. To the other members of the commission and distinguished uh, members, uh, it's an honor to be here. As the governor said, I am Arthur Dean, uh, Major General U.S. Army, retired. And I've had the great fortune for the last 18 years after my military service to serve as the chairman and CEO of Community Anti-Drug Coalitions of America. CATCA came out of a presidential commission uh, back, uh, that commission met in the late 80s and established CATCA in 1992. That was an issue called cocaine back then. Uh, <clears throat> Ian Bice had uh, died, uh, who was a basketball star at the University of Maryland. And they created a not-for-profit to serve as a national organization to lead and develop community-based, multi-sector coalitions to address substance abuse at the local level. We've grown from a few hundred in 1992 to over 5,000 community coalitions today. And these coalitions are working on the front lines all across America, trying to prevent and reduce the misuse and abuse of drugs, particularly the, uh, among our youth. For over two decades, CATCA evidence-based, multi-sector coalitions have united communities in addressing and preventing all areas of substance abuse to include illicit drugs, underage use of alcohol and tobacco, and the misuse of prescriptions and over-the-counter drugs. We at CATCA had our first news uh, release and conference on addressing prescription drugs in, 19, in 2002. Our coalitions were telling us the problem was beginning to develop. History has shown us and demonstrated to us that there is no panacea to solving this problem. There is no single solution to solving this problem. It is very complicated, it is very far reaching, and I'll tell you, it affects every community in America. We used to think it was the inner city, we used to think it was Appalachian, we used to think it was the South and other areas. It is everywhere across this great nation. Um, that is why CATCA believes in the full continuum of care. We believe in evidence-based prevention, and we've been doing this for over two decades. 
We believe in evidence-based <coughs> intervention, treatment, recovery support, effective law enforcement is critical, and addiction strategies are necessary. And what we believe, though, that prevention over the last few years has not been given its rightful emphasis, and we need to get back to giving prevention its place and, and, and treating it as an equal partner in the field as we move forward. As you've heard already, I think it's worthy of repeating that, uh, that it is well documented that addiction is a developmental disorder which begins in adolescence, sometimes as early as childhood. Thus, the land age of first use is critical in ensuring that there are fewer youth in America and young adults develop this issue. <coughs> History has told us that uh, you cannot, in isolation, either legislate or tax your way out of this problem. We cannot, and I heard uh, one of the governors say this earlier, treat or imprison our way out of this problem. We asked law enforcement to do this back in the 70s and 80s, and we know what it got us. We cannot scare or educate our way out of this problem, and we cannot simply love or hope our way out of this problem. I believe that community-based evidence multi-sectors coalitions is one of the means that we can use to help prevent people from getting to the point where we have to give them naloxone. Naloxone is critical and necessary, but we want to prevent as many as possible from getting there. CATCA feels strongly that prevention has been underutilized relative to its importance and cost effectiveness and reducing population level, and we believe population level is a way to look at this issue all of the people that live in Trenton, all of the people that live in Charlotte, North Carolina, all of the people that live in Worcester, New, uh, Massachusetts, we want to address all of them, not just a few handful of them, all of them, and it's important that we, that we do that. There's data, clear data, that says every dollar invested in prevention will save you, depending on the study you read, from $2 to $20, and clearly we need to be about saving money. Uh, therefore, I want to urge you to do just a few simple things that I think will have a tremendous impact on reducing first use, preventing people from getting to addiction, and addressing the problem. There's a program that we created uh, with the help of Congress and, and many of the great leaders of Congress called the Drug-Free Communities Program. Most all of you states have these federally funded coalitions within your states. They are, there's been a, a, a bipartisan um, supported effort since 1998 because they deal with the problem at the hometown local community level. It's important that we do that. The DFC program especially recognizes that a small amount of federal dollars designed to help the coalition grow that are matched 100% locally, it's only $125,000 per coalition has the greatest chance of bringing together on a multi-sector, multi-strategy approach, parents, youth, the medical community, business leaders, faith, law enforcement, you name it, all together to work the problem holistically, strategically at the local level, you can in fact save lives and you can prevent this problem from spreading. The program has never been fully funded. We've struggled to get it up to 97 million in FY17. Its max authorization is $129 million. We believe that investing $129 million in this program would take it to many, many more communities and we could in fact begin to have a tremendous impact. We also believe that the program belongs in the Office of National Drug Control Policy from an, author, from an administration perspective and we strongly recommend that continues to happen. Two, we want to we ask you to support uh, ONDCP community-based coalition enhancement group program, which was made a part of CARA. It's only a small program; it's five million dollars, but it's taken the coalition infrastructure that we've trained now since 1998, that is effective in addressing local community problems and giving them a small enhancement grant to specifically address prescription drug abuse. Uh, and we recommend that that $5 million be allocated. It was allocated for $3 million of 5 and 17 and 0 of 5 and 18. So that's an issue that we have to continue to work on. For an example, 
Let me give you some example. For an independent evaluation of the DFC program has showed that the percentage of change, talking about 30-day prevalence now, of uh, prescription drug use specifically, these coalitions have decreased in their communities 14.3% among middle, uh, uh, middle school students and 19.7% among high school students. This is an independent evaluation done of drug-free communities looking at what they've done in their communities on this particular issue. I have in general, one, I'm just going to have to ask you to start to wrap up. Okay, I will. One quick example is Carter County in, in, in Kentucky. Uh, this coalition had a real serious problem. They put together evidence-based strategies, and they took their 12% issue among misuse and abuse of prescription drugs for 10th graders to 1% in 10 years. They took 11% problem to 1% for seniors. We believe that, um, uh, that if you address the problem at the local level through multiple strategies, you can, in fact, do this. We've been working with the Drug, the drug Enforcement Administration, and we've been to six cities helping them address this issues, and we have another six cities that we're scheduled to go to uh, all across this country. I want to close by saying that we at CATCA believe in the full continuum. We are a little concerned, though, that CARA, excuse me, I'm sorry, the 21st Century Cures dollars were not properly placed out into states. And if you continue to focus only on treatment and not focus in a strategic evidence-based approach to prevention, you're not going to get what you need to get. So I'm saying to the commission that I believe that we can, we know how to prevent and delay first use, but we need to have federal policy guidance and dollars to match that. And currently, I sadly to say that we are not doing that. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. I appreciate your time and your efforts over the years uh, in this regard in a number of different areas, so thank you, sir. Uh, Hugh Gow, uh, Young People in Recovery. Hugh, thank you for being here. I look forward to hearing your testimony. Yeah, good afternoon, and thank you for allowing me the opportunity to be here today. My name is Hugh Gwill, and I'm the Vice President of Programs at Young People in Recovery. I'm a former Teach for America Corps member and 6th through 12th grade charter school principal. Before I resigned from my principal position on June 5th of 2014, following my arrest for cocaine possession on June 4th of 2014. I've been in recovery ever since, and have now dedicated my professional career to helping others achieve this, this uh, wonderful lifestyle that I have found. Young People in Recovery, or YPR, provides life skills, trainings, and networks that assist individuals, families, and communities in the process of recovering and maximizing their full potential. We do this through our curriculum programs in treatment centers and in criminal justice organizations and through our volunteer networks of chapters where we execute our advocacy objectives. But I'm not here today to really talk about YPR or sell YPR, we're doing just fine. What I'm here today to do is to provide a blueprint to this commission for what my organization believes to be the appropriate next steps that the federal government should take to solve a crisis to provide a blueprint for creating recovery ready communities. Whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, a fan of small government or large government, this is an issue that affects every community in every state. A person with a substance use disorder in California or in Texas or in Ohio is very similar to the person that suffers from substance use disorder right here in DC. And similarly, a person in recovery in California or in Texas or in Ohio is very similar to the person who's living a recovery lifestyle right here in DC. Addiction is addiction, and the prevention of, and treatment of, and recovery from addiction works wherever you live. People that tell you otherwise are misinformed, and they're trying to complicate a problem that doesn't need more debate, it needs immediate action. As a result, the solutions that you come across need to be incredibly similar from community to community, with the, with the power for communities to choose their own colors and theme songs and mascots and flags and things along those lines. And let me be clear, whereas today it's opiates, tomorrow it's going to be something else, and then it's going to be something else, and then it's going to be something else. But a recovery-ready community is just that. It's ready for whatever substance comes next. So what, it, what makes a community uh, recovery-ready? Well, the following is a chronological timeline 
of what my organization believes a recovery ready community to have. Standardized and evidence-based middle school and high school prevention programs, access to a recovery high school, access to a collegiate recovery program or a collegiate recovery center, equitable access to acute inpatient treatment, the implementation and oversight of problem solving courts, including drug courts and law enforcement assisted diversion programs, also known as LEAD, that can operate with the best interests of the public in mind and also provide an opportunity for the person that needs help to be held accountable, get the care they need, and become a, become a productive member of society. Access to life skills and jobs training to the, for those in treatment and those that are criminal justice involved. Access to gainful employment opportunities and stable and secure housing for those in recovery or those with criminal convictions. And then access to harm reduction services, including syringe access programs, infectious disease screenings, safe using spaces, and the lock zone training for drug users, first responders, and other community members. Obviously, we can't snap our fingers and have this become a reality today, but this is the world that we need to and must work towards. But what you can do today is take this framework, look at the data that is out there, get rid of all the noise, and determine what proven practices can be scaled in as many communities as possible that save lives. If it were up to us at YPR, we'd prioritize a few of those components where I just, which I just listed. Real quick, standardized and evidence-based middle school and high school programs, uh, prevention programs, equitable access to acute inpatient treatment followed by structured recovery supports, the implementation of problem-solving courts, access to life skills and jobs training for those in recovery or those uh, that are criminal justice involved, and access to safe using spaces and naloxone training. Again, look at the data. Look at the numbers. There's more than enough of it out there. Figure out what programs work that can be scaled and fund those programs and provide those programs with technical assistance to reach across the nation. On the flip side of the coin, figure out what programs aren't working and stop funding them. This isn't charity money. It's your taxpayer, taxpayer dollars. America can't afford to continue to give to things that don't work. We all know that a person, a person in active addiction is incredibly destructive and incredibly costly. Destructive to themselves, their families, their communities, their friends, incredibly costly to the American taxpayer. With that said, a person living in recovery in whatever pathway works for them, there are many out there that work, is incredibly constructive and incredibly inexpensive. YPR understands that the old adage of spend money to make money is a tough political sell. But we're talking about an epidemic here, and if this commission and the federal government can take steps to address this epidemic, take tangible steps to save lives, you're gonna have the love and the respect and the votes of millions and millions of people. Be the ones to change the course of history. It's an amazing opportunity and provide millions and millions of individuals, families, and communities the opportunity to recover and maximize their full potential. YPR believes in each and every one of you, and we're here to help in any way we can. Thank you so much for your time today. You, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Um, lastly, we'll go to Dr. John Renner, from the American Academy of Addiction Psychiatry. Dr. Renner. Thank you very much, Governor Christie and members of the commission. Uh, I'm John Renner. I'm an addiction psychiatrist. I'm president of the American Academy of Addiction Psychiatry. We represent the subspecialty area of psychiatry that focuses on addiction. Uh, and I want to look at what the interface is between substance use problems and other psychiatric problems. And I want to just emphasize some of the things I think you've heard already. I don't think a lot of this is new information. I think the first point that I want to make is that we need adequate funding. We need full parity. Uh, and I think if we don't have that available, uh, I think everything we're talking about is really going to be wasted. Uh, the underlying issue here, I think, is really stigma. We know what to do. The money is available. We've known for years what to do, but it hasn't been implemented. If this was any other area of medicine and this information was available, it would have been implemented years ago and it would have been paid for. So I think your leadership is going to be critical, and one of those things is going to have to be the stigma, because that's what's getting in the way of implementing a lot of the things that you've heard about today. I want to specifically talk to the mental health issues. 50 to 70 percent of the people who present with a substance abuse problem have at least one and sometimes two or three other psychiatric disorders. We're talking about depression, anxiety disorders, PTSD, bipolar, ADHD, all of that complicates their problem. If you look at the number of IV drug users because they use needles, we're talking about medical problems. We're talking about hepatitis C, we're talking about HIV, we're talking about 
about a whole range of medical drug-borne diseases that are incredibly expensive to treat. Uh, so what we have to see is this is a relapsing brain disease. It's a chronic illness, but it's a complicated illness. We cannot treat the substance use itself unless we're treating the psychiatric problems and unless we have the capacity to treat the co-occurring medical, medical problems. So it all has to be a package. So you need comprehensive care and adequate funding. Uh, so I think that's number one, the bottom line. The, the next line is as you, <coughs> the issue of what is the addiction treatment itself. And you've heard from many of the members of the commission today about evidence-based treatment. We know what works. And we need to make sure that that is what is being funded and cared for and provided and not wasting money on treatment that doesn't work. And particularly for opiate use disorder, that's medication-assisted treatment. That, that has been the most effective thing. And I think what's particularly important to recognize is we have the research that shows it's cost effective as well as clinically effective. I mean, people who are getting medication assisted treatment end up costing the system less because there are fewer hospitalizations, there are fewer emergency room visits, there are fewer medical complications. You know, one treatment for, for hepatitis C or one treatment for some blood borne infection can wipe out the cost for several years of addiction treatment. You know, so this is cost effective to make sure that that type of treatment is available. The, the next point I want to make, and there hasn't been much focus today, is the criminal justice system or the justice system in general. We are warehousing hundreds of thousands of people. And it, it's clear that the majority of these individuals have substance use problems. The majority of these individuals have mental health problems. And we are missing the boat in terms of not providing treatment. We're spending an enormous amount of money on justice system situations that people come out of often in worse shape than they do when they went in in the first place. And dollars spent this way are cost effective. For every dollar or two spent in the justice system, you're going to save about $12 if you've spent that money on treatment. You know, so we've missed a huge opportunity. Uh, and we're wasting money that we don't need to waste. So I think we have to do something about the justice system. Uh, and then the, the last thing is the, the workforce issues. I've spent most of my life working with physicians, trying to train them to work in substance abuse uh, areas. Uh, and I think that the stigma is enormous, just like the stigma is present in the rest of our society. It, it's, as they walk in the door of medical school, it's there. We need to look at how people are dealt with in medical school. We have to look at how people are handled in residency. Uh, we have to look at the advanced training. Uh, Dr. Clark was mentioning earlier the question of the fellowships. What we're talking about is that when people finish medicine residencies or psychiatry residencies, they need an additional year of addiction medicine or addiction psychiatry training. We need more opportunities to do that because we do not have enough experts. We don't have enough people to treat the really complicated people with addictions. But what these experts also do is they become medical school faculty. Uh, they become the mentors. Uh, to the other clinicians. So if, if we want the general practice physicians and the general psychiatrists to do a good job treating these individuals, and we do, they need the mentors in the back door, if you will, to give them the supervision and to help them do that. So we have a tremendous workforce issue because we don't have enough specialists. Uh, and I really would like you to consider really creative ways of doing that. Uh, because there are interest in medical students and residents, but right now what happens is people come out of medical school and residency which, with such huge debts that they're driven towards the medical specialties that have higher reimbursements. And I think you need to think about creative ways to reimburse medical school and, and college debts. I think that should be tied to getting specialty training in addiction medicine and addiction psychiatry, and I think it should be tied to people who are then willing to work for a couple of years in underserved areas. Uh, and your leadership is going to be very important. Governor Baker was very effective putting pressure on the medical schools in Massachusetts, and they really responded. I mean, they, they have changed their way, the way they teach, and it, was, it didn't cost anyone anything, but it was good leadership, uh, and it mattered in terms of the curriculum in the medical schools. So I, so I think there are things that can be done with leadership uh, and with supporting the, the development of the workforce. AAAP uh, has two, runs two initiatives 
initiatives that are funded by SAMHSA, the Physicians Clinical Support System on Opioid Therapies and the Physicians Clinical Support System uh, on Medication Assisted Treatment. And most of the organizations that are here today are part of that overall system. Uh, we've trained hundreds of thousands of professionals to do a better job uh, providing treatment. We create webinars. Uh, we, we create all sorts of backup information that is helpful to help people become better experts. But I don't want to make it sound easy because I think stigma gets in the way. Physicians are uncomfortable working with people with addiction problems just like the general public is. And unless we really train people to be comfortable, to be optimistic, to know the treatment works, to know that you can do that, then I think you're going to have problems. And I think we've seen the response to the CDC where we've looked at the number of people who were getting far too many opiates, and instead of really getting adequate treatment and detox, a lot of the physicians just ran away. They just stopped treating them. Uh, and I think we ended up with worse problems because I think some people with chronic pain ended up and they ultimately ending having an opiate use disorder uh, simply because the physician did not know how to manage the issue of their chronic medication. So we've got a lot to do, and the resources are there. The organizations that are working with AAAP have really done a lot to make this information available, but we need to support that kind of training and to make sure it gets to the people who need it. Thank, Thank you, Doctor. Thank appreciate you. it. Um, appreciate the testimony of all the folks here. And um, we have a few minutes for some questions. Um, so I'd like to turn it to Governor Cooper first, um, if he has any questions for any of the folks who testified far away. Dr. Clark, you and both uh, General Dean mentioned about not wasting money. I can't hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. Dr. Clark, you and both uh, General Dean mentioned about wasting money on non evidence based treatment and prevention. Do you have any idea about what percentage of reimbursement for, say, Medicaid or many private insurance policies would be reimbursing uh, non-evidence-based treatment? Well, thank you for that question. Um, I wish I had a specific uh, number, and you know, perhaps the general has a specific number, but I can tell you that typically the utilization of inpatient detoxification or, and then 28-day uh, manualized rehabilitation is not evidence-based care. We know that uh, detoxification is not considered treatment by ASAM for opioid addiction. We're using a lot of expensive care in inpatient uh, environments and not the ongoing care that we need to do for chronic brain disease treatment. It's substantial. One, one other question would be, uh, Jessica, have you seen problems with increasing costs with naloxone in, in your experiences and, and if any others are chiming in. I'm, I'm getting rec reports of increasing costs for naloxone and uh, decrease in availability when we need to be getting it out more. We've heard from some of our communities about concerns about getting enough naloxone and particularly with synthetic opioids with fentanyl. Um, popping up when you need multiple doses of Narcan to reverse an overdose on a synthetic opioid. Um, and then, of course, there's still pockets of, of um, communities where we need more um, education and awareness that this is an important thing to provide multiple times and then use those intervening moments to connect them with, with care and with treatment. Excellent. Governor Baker, a question for any of the like Gary's, it's available and you know about it. Um, I heard most of the folks from the treatment side say, 
we know it works, but we don't do it, or we don't do it as often as we should. And this just makes me wonder, and, and I heard somebody say, I thought it was one of the best lines I heard of all, which is that somehow we have to figure out how to mainstream in the medical community this whole issue of addiction to begin with. And, um, and start to think about it and deal with it the same way we've been dealing with coronary artery disease and certain forms of cancer and, and other issues for a long time where, you know, the specialists, people who really understood this stuff, got together, figured out what best practice was, and then beat the brains in of everybody else who was in their space to do it the right way or get out. And, and the funny thing about it is all those other people were doing it because it was life and death in many respects that they start keeping track. Well, this is life and death too. The mortality rate for this stuff is as high as it is anywhere. And I guess one of the questions I would have is what role, because this isn't a payment issue. It's partly a payment issue, but it's a whole bunch of other things too. What's the, what's the way to try to take this funnel of notions and try and go like this with it and get it to the point where we're really focusing I'll take on the things that work and the things that matter and finding a way to disperse that information you know, I really appreciate you bringing up the, the, the fact that, you know, we just use sheer force of personality to get the medical. And by the way, we, we haven't talked at all about dentists, and we really should. Um, dental schools, medical schools, nursing schools, pharmacy schools. In Massachusetts, you can't graduate from any of them if you don't take pass a course in opioid therapy. And if you're prescriber, you can't get relicensed. I mean, no offense, but this is where this thing came from, the healthcare world. And um, we, we got we to gotta figure out some way to, to really reframe the way we think about this stuff. Gary, Gary? you want to take sure. a look at that? Um, like anything, there's, there's short-term fixes that can solve a half to two-thirds of it, and then there's long-term fixes that will cover the other third over decades, right? What we're doing is, on the, let's, let's divide it, treatment and prevention, really quick, simple. On the, preven on the treatment side, I'm going to correct one thing you said as far as, not corrected, but I think all of us say we have enough information. This side and that side, we all know what needs to be done. I just read ASAM's material. I can read HHS material. It's all there. So the question is we don't know who's doing what. So what we're doing is, what Shadow Group has already done, we're just starting it. We have our first meeting coming up in September. We, we brought together a group of all the top seven behavioral health payers in the country and all the top researchers in the country. And we're coming together into one process. Right now there's dozens and dozens of evidence-based protocols. Cigna has them, Optum has them, uh, Beacon has them, uh, ASAM, everyone has them. Kelly's gonna be involved in this process and we're gonna get together in one uh, meeting where we're, we're coming up, we're gonna present that group with a rough draft. And then we're gonna break into subgroups, create a second uh, rough draft. We're taking the dozens and dozens of evidence-based protocols, narrow it down to less than 20 of the core protocols, quality measures that every treatment program should provide. And then we'll create a subgroup and we'll give them two or three months to finalize it and come back to the group for approval. And this will be the first time that all payers hopefully will agree on one set of quality measures, less than 20. And then it's very simple. We need a system in place to measure it. We know what to do. We don't know who's doing what. So if we can narrow the list to 20 or less, put a system in place to measure it, put out a report once a year of the 15,000 providers out there, who's doing which one of these well, and publish it. The payers will have it, they'll pay off it, and they'll incentivize off it. Consumers will have it, and they'll know where to, where to send their loved ones. Actually, not that complicated. Now, is this going to solve all of it? No. And, and by the way, I pulled this right out of the 2006 IOM report. That's 400 pages, it's right there. So that's treatment. Prevention, really simple. We've talked about a lot of stuff. If we're talking about opioids, it's very simple. We have the CDC guideline. If every primary care doctor in this country followed the CDC guideline, you would cut by more than half instantly the number of new people becoming addicted. So how do we get it done? I laid it out there. We need a system of measurement. And we need to divide it up. What is the goal for the country? Divide it up by 50 states, a proper goal developed by the CDC with an HHS. And then we need to publicize it and hold people accountable, just the way you would do in any business. Yeah. Thank you, Gary. Um, 
Yes, sir, Mitchell. Thank you. <clears throat> I am, as a physician, very excited with the advances in medically assisted programs and with evidence-based, and uh, the work that Gary's doing is terrific. Let's remember, we have 23 million people who are in recovery in the United States, and most of them uh, got there uh, by various routes, but a lot of them got there through peer-related support systems like AA. Um, the, the therapeutic communities, which has been my life's work, are very powerful uh, in creating new bonds of friendship and strength and support that are critical. And in all our discussion today, we didn't touch on how powerful peer, peer treatment, peer support is. And the good programs, the good evidence-based programs, are going to use this phenomenon and use this uh, peer power or patient power. It is strong, it changes lives, and it changes lives long term. And I just wanted to put that on the record. Joe? Good comment. I'll, I'll go right go. to you, Jim, right after Joe. So I agree with the, the statement about measurement, and I think the Certified Community Behavioral Health Center approach to payment is one that enforces that. These centers have to stipulate what evidence-based treatment they're doing. They don't get paid for just any treatment. When they get certified and accepted, I'm doing this treatment, this treatment, that treatment, so you can go in and hold them accountable. And they have to report continuously measures related to the success of that treatment. That's how you can tell what evidence-based worked and what isn't. And that's the condition for them getting a payment, a payment that is set that's adequate to cover their costs so they don't go out of business doing it. That's the kind of integrated approach that will get us there. General. Yes, quickly, from a, a uh, prevention perspective, uh, we over the last couple of decades have determined there are about seven strategies you can implement to change a community so that it can build up its protection against this problem and prevent the problem from happening. But what we find happening when you don't have a multi-sector trained coalition in a community the community is spending lots of money on informational kinds of programs. For an example, you know, you're bringing a public speaker into a high school to give a, 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 a remark at an assembly. Unfortunately, that doesn't change the attitudes of the kids. Uh, but if you have a trained coalition in your community, you understand that you've got to work the, the three strategies that focus on skills and information. But you've got to work the other four strategies that changes the community meaning you're changing policies, practices, procedures, working with your legislature, working with your judges, et cetera. Uh, and that's what we say when we say evidence-based prevention strategies. Uh, but do good, fill kinds of activities. Uh, what a community will do if it doesn't have the appropriate people in place to help them. And, pe and we're spending, I go in the community, they're spending lots of money uh, I don't want to pick on any particular segment, but you got a lot of, you know, you got former athletes coming in to give a remark. Those don't really work. Thank you. I, I am sensitive to everybody's uh, time constraints on a Friday afternoon in June. Um, <clears throat> so I I'd just like to, to close the meeting by saying a few things. First, to thank all of you who have come in today and, and spoken to us. I appreciate it a great deal, and I, and I hope that you would be willing um, to come again. Uh, and to also respond to written requests that we have because there's a lot more to talk about. But I, I, I was touched by how um, each of you um, had some real areas of consistency throughout your testimony. Uh, and that's, I think, very, very important. I, I want to also, I forgot to do this off the top, is to thank Danielle from the Department of Justice and Jason from the Department of Education uh, for being here to represent the Attorney General and Secretary DeVos. And I think from the comments that you all heard today, you know that, that DOJ and Department of Education are going to be indispensable in trying to deal with this issue on all three areas from prevention perspective, from a uh, treatment perspective, and an education perspective. So we're, we're very happy to have you both here, and we thank both the Attorney General and Secretary DeVos for having you join us today and look forward to continuing to work with you on a lot of other matters. 
Uh, but I was touched by the consistency in what we're hearing around this table for people from different experiences, different disciplines. Um, I've said often that the, we're not walking around in a dark room except for the, the, the matter that Dr. Renner brought up, and I know Patrick brought it up in his remarks as well. And I want to end with this. I find in our state and when I've traveled around the country that the biggest problem we have is what Dr. Renner said about stigma. Uh, you know, all these other diseases that we talked about that we've analogized up here and that you have as well, um, all have human conduct contributions to them as well. Whether you're talking about cancer or heart disease or diabetes, all of them have human conduct contributions to them. Yet, uh, we have moved in our society to a place where we don't um, uh, shoot the victim in that regard. And we say, okay, what can we do to help you now that you find yourself in this circumstance? We've done it completely differently when it comes to this disease. And so much of this is going to be about us speaking out very strongly about the fact that this is a disease that can be treated and that it is not a moral failing. And I use this analogy all the time, and we'll, we'll end with this today. Uh, my mother was an addict. Uh, my mother was addicted to nicotine. And she started smoking when she was 16 years old, and by the time she was 30, the Surgeon General report said come out and she knew it was killing her, and she continued to smoke for 55 years. And at 71 years old, when she was inevitably, it seemed to me, diagnosed with lung cancer and died two and a half months later. Uh, during that intervening period of time, no one ever came to me and said, well, Chris, she smoked for 55 years. Your mother got what she deserved. She made a choice, an informed choice. No, everybody came and said, here's a doctor she could go to. Here's a new clinical trial that she could do. Here's a support group for your family. And we just want to pray for her and have her get better. And I never had any problem with telling anyone that my mother was suffering from lung cancer. It wasn't a point of shame for me, even though her conduct had given her that disease. Now, I just wonder if I had felt that way if she was a heroin addict. And I suspect that I wouldn't have because we think somehow that reflects upon us as a father or a mother, as a brother or a sister, as a son or a daughter. Only way for us to get people to access all these great treatments that we're talking about, all this great education, is to get parents to be talking about it, to get friends to be trying to help friends who they suspect may have a problem. And I think the biggest goal of this commission is to bring this up out of the shadows and into the light, because if we do, and you all are the experts around the country, and you're right about this, that there are the treatments available, that we know the answers. Well, then all we need to do is to get people be willing to accept them, and not just when it's too late to accept them. Um, so I want to thank everybody who's here today. I appreciate it very, very much. I can tell you the President cares deeply about this issue, and that he is prepared to involve himself directly and personally in trying to help to lift the stigma across the country. He understands it well and personally, and I, and I know that he will, uh, he will work with us on this. We'll be back in touch with you by writing and maybe in another meeting as well. Uh, and I want to thank the members of the Commission for being here today, the Governors, Cooper and Baker, uh, Professor Madras and, and Congressman Kennedy. Thank you all for being here, and everyone travel home safely on Friday. <laughs>